1973, the New York City Police Department created a hostage negotiation team. It's not up against the gun. It's up against the man's mind. When you're defusing a human bomb, it's the same as when you're taking apart a real bomb. If you skip a step, it's going to blow up right in your face. Talk to Me tells the high-stakes true story of the world's first hostage negotiation team. It changed policing forever. Talk to me. Hello, welcome to CarCast. I'm Matt, the moderator, D'Andrea. We're going to mix things up a little bit today. Uh, Adam is out today. It's uh, a little odd. Adam's out today. He doesn't normally miss a day, but uh, it just schedule was so jammed up and hitting the road and doing stuff that uh, it was just kind of nuts. So uh, I've invited back my good friend Brad Fanshawe from Bond Speed Wheels. Brad's uh, uh, my co-host as well on the Shift and Steer podcast, along with Aaron Hagar, who's been here for a few times. Uh, hey, Brad. How you doing? How's it going, man? Doing good to be right. back. Uh, I, you're, you're like zooming from home, which is weird. I've never seen you outside of your office. <laughs> I know. I'm always at the shop, but uh, got a lot going on. And uh, so I figured rather than try and make it to the shop in time, I'd just do it from the house here. Right so, on. yeah. Uh, good. I want to check in on a, on a, a couple of different things. Um, the bond speed wheels. I mean, uh, I, it's been a while since you've been on the show. I know you've been building – building cars, building wheels. Um, what's new at Bond Speed? Let's get into that a little bit. Man, we've been busy. You know, um, everybody during the pandemic was staying home working on their cars, it seemed like. So we have been machining lots of custom wheels. And, uh, you know, all of our wheels are made right here in Anaheim, California. We machine every set to order. And it's for hot rods, customs, Porsches, um, you name it. We've, we've done them for just about everything with the exception of big lifted off-road trucks. That's about the only market we're not really part of. The lowered trucks and, you know, moderately raised, great. But if they've got a 33-inch tall tire or larger, we don't get into that because of load ratings. But we've been uh, busy. We've been, we've been uh, coming up with some new styles. We're working on a new website right now. We just finished the new Bond Speed Wheels catalog. So, uh, you know, it's it's one of those things that you, uh, you're you busy, and the only thing that keeps us from getting the stuff out the door are some of these damn, uh, you know, uh, delays in the system that we've been hearing about. Aluminum is one of them. Rims are one of them. But we keep it going. We, we keep a good inventory and keep everything moving. You guys have been getting into uh, steering wheels as well, billet steering wheels, and some things to even match the actual wheels you, if you want to go down that route. Yeah, we've been doing those for a long time. We offer them in a variety. We, we match every single wheel, and you can order them in a three or a five spoke because some guys want them to look exactly like the wheel. Others want to be able to actually see their gauges. And uh, so, you know, it's uh, – yeah, but uh, you know it's it's the the performance guy versus the custom car guy. You know they have different preferences, and then we can match the finishes and everything. And we do a leather grip, and we offer the adapters and everything. And uh, yeah, that's something we've been doing a long time, and really have kind of uh, streamlined it because uh, it used to be we took a giant chunk of aluminum mat and and machined it. And threw half the aluminum away. Now we start with a stamping, and then we machine that stamping, which is much more efficient. You know, I Bond Speed Wheels has been around for a long time, and then everything that you did at Boyd's before that, and the SEMA builds and stuff. But I, I don't know if this is a a specific like division or something that you do just for friends in your space. But Bond Speed has a has done a number of one-off special wheels for either high-end builds and stuff. Certainly, listeners of CarCast know it's no secret that I've got bond speeds on my 93 Cobra that we brought the SEMA in 2016. That was a catalog piece. We just picked the finishes and stuff. Yeah, we customized it with finishing, yeah, and custom caps. But the 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 four Lightning wheels were, were a custom piece. But you've done 
custom pieces for a number of of very, very famous SEMA builds that people may not know that you did the wheels for, a number of Steve Strope cars, for example. Correct. And also, um, you know, we've, we've done them, you know, with uh, Pete Shaporis and, uh, you know, SoCal Speed Shop, Jimmy yeah. Shine, uh, a, lot of, a lot of people. And some of the other notable people are like uh, we did some wheels for Billy Gibbons of ZZ Top for his BMW. Yeah. And I did a set of wheels for Sammy Hagar's Ferrari. And um, and uh, most recently, uh, Craig Jackson, the owner of Barrett Jackson, is building a pro touring Shelby GT500. And he asked me to build some one-off wheels for that project. And we just finished those up. They bolted them on, and he sent me pictures, and I'm so proud to be on that because it's going to be one hell of a car. I don't even. I think that's a secret project. I don't think you're supposed to talk about that one yet. Well, <laughs> it's although out I don't, of that now. I'm although sorry. I'm not quite yeah. sure because it's going to be awesome. And uh, Craig, yeah. by the way, Craig Jackson, a hell of a car collector and uh, uh, a fabricator as well. Not a lot of people know this about Craig, but because um, he's been here in the studio with us a few times and. Pictures of him without the the suit jacket on at out in the auction block in his garage with the t shirt like cutting and welding and and uh, he's he's a hell of a car guy. Hey, that guy knows how to do it. I mean, his dad made him learn. And um, going way back, I used to do a radio show called Rod and Custom Radio, and I had him on. I was one of the first ones to have him on and talk about that. And I said, I don't want to talk about the auction. I mean, we can hit on it. And he goes, well, what are we going to talk about? And I said, I want to talk about it. He goes, oh, I don't really talk about that. And he told me how he wanted a Corvette when he was in high school. And his dad said, you got to earn it and uh, made him go out in the shop. He knows how to bend metal. He knows, you know, how to shape metal, do everything. And he has restored some very serious classic cars like Duesenbergs and Delahays and, you know, been involved in that and uh, some Ferraris. And, uh, you know, a lot of people don't talk about it because they just think of Craig the auction guy. You right. Know? He does everything except make wheels. That's where you come in. <laughs> That's right. He calls me for that. He calls you so, for that. Um, until now, I've, you know, talked about his yeah. uh, project out of the out of the box. Now he probably won't call me. <laughs> He's like, God damn it. Uh, although, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Steve Strobe's cars have showed up at uh, – at at SEMA a few times and, and debuted the wheels for the first time. So somehow you managed to keep that secret. <laughs> well, you know, come on. We're talking about a GT500 Pro Touring car. There could be a lot of things done to that car. I didn't talk about the details such as the – no, I won't do that. <laughs> uh, as a former BMX guy. And, oh, yeah. And now a BMX collector, along with Strope, by the way. Yes, right? very much so. And I'm, we've done some horse trading on uh, – Parts too. I when are you going to start making some BMX pieces? Are you going to make a billet wheel for your BMX? <laughs> I think lightweight but, is the theme, so maybe not. There actually is a guy that made a set of billet moto mags and uh, put them on his motorcycle, and they look so cool. But no, I'm not going to do that. Now I won't say because, as you know, I I started an electric bike company, which were very custom electric bikes. Looked like bobber motorcycles. I started that, grew it, and sold it uh, to a company up in San Francisco, a tech company who wanted to just own our technology. Um, but so with that background in where we actually made the frame jigs, we did the jigs, we did the frames, we did everything right in my warehouse. I'm not going to say that maybe someday uh, we might not do a Bond Speed BMX frame or something, but it would be retro. It wouldn't be yeah. like the new ones that are all carbon fiber, and it'd be more old school. Right. So let's tell us a little bit about that because, again, it's been a minute. What's your BMX background? Oh, man. Um, <laughs> back when, back when Oakley was making handle grips, not sunglasses, right? Like that was <laughs> – Unfortunately, yes, I am that old. I was there <laughs> at the beginning practically. Um, but I started racing when I lived in San Diego at tracks like Rancho San Diego, the bike shop at El Cajon, Lakewood, classic, classic, uh, you know, BMX racing. And I rode side hacks with Scott Bryhop, who is like the founder of BMX. And um, 
we uh, we raced. And then I moved to the Midwest. I raced pro out of the Midwest, and then when uh, I was going to college on a journalism degree, journalism, advertising, and marketing, and uh, ended up going to work for the American Bicycle Association because I wanted to be a magazine editor and did that for a couple of years, but found out I liked the business side of things more and ended up being the vice president of the company running the whole show and learning how to drive heavy equipment, front loaders, skip loaders, to build the actual tracks. And, um, and, then, and then from there, I uh, met my buddy Brad Dorfman and moved to California, and we grew Vision Streetwear together. And Vision uh, put me on the other side. We became the sponsors of the races and of the riders, and I sponsored almost every old-school pro you can think of in BMX racing and BMX freestyle. So I've been pretty heavy into it, know all the guys, and um, even was uh, hired back, uh, I think, 2006, could have the date wrong, by the ABA to help them integrate BMX into the Olympics and uh, was a real big uh, part of doing all that. So uh, keep it, and I still keep in touch with all the guys. And as you said, um, as part of my company, Win Brad Stuff, I'm always collecting for myself and, uh, you know, pulling stuff out that I find uh, and then resell. How, how, when did you make the transition from bikes to cars? When you became an adult? <laughs> when, no. I'm kidding. I, as soon as I could get a, a learner's permit, I was a car guy, man. I mean, yeah. you know. And I, well, I know you were building um, hot rods and, and tweaking on the muscle cars like all of us when we were oh, 16. Yeah. But. And, and that probably hampered my career as a pro BMXer because – Instead of being out doing gate starts and practicing like all my competitors, I was working on my Chevelle, my 67 Chevelle, and um, and building, you know, hot rods, like you said. And being in the Midwest, man, brother, I'm telling you, there were some cars on the street. I, I remember pulling into my high school parking lot, and imagine this, Matt. You pull in, and there are 429 you know, uh, motored Mustangs. There are uh, 64 and a half, literally in the parking lot of my high school, 64 and a half lightweight Ford Galaxy. Um, there were, uh, you know, Hemi, Hemi Cudas, Hemi uh, Super Bs. And um, I had a, a 67 Chevelle and I worked at the local speed shop. So I had this thing dialed in at 450, it had a big block, I had a power glide with a high stall converter. I had nine inch uh, slicks in the trunk um, and uh, and I had 456 gears and I was one of the very first people uh, in that area to have nitrous. And I had a nitrous tank mounted in the trunk. And um, that that thing was, it was a good little street racer. You were the original Fast and Furious, working at the speed shop, putting the first nitrous kit on there. And hard to believe that movie was 23 years ago. And this was way before that. Yeah. You know, my I, mom I, would tell me I was too fast and too furious all the time, you know? Uh, in in high school, that's I was doing something similar. Like we were, uh, we were in South Florida. Mustangs was a big scene. Camaro was a big scene. Um uh, a few people rolled out with a Viper when that came out. It was like, what, 92? Yeah. Um, not a lot of import you cars. You built prototype wheels for it, boys. Oh, there you go. Not, yeah. a, not a lot of import cars. We did have a guy like with a really fast like RX-7. Just a, just everything you can do on that thing was done to that thing, and it made a hell of a lot of noise. And it was fast, but once – you know, the Mustangs and the Camaro started putting like superchargers on Vortec made the scene. And I was, I was working, you know, uh, I was working at Pet Boys. I was working the parts counter there and they had their installation shop and we were special ordering all the the hot rod parts, the Holly stuff and the exhaust and all that. And walking over and like, you know, Hey, I got to go do a shift where you put, you know, you get your buddy in the service department to install something for you. Um, yeah, it was it was fun. It was fun back then. Now, times have changed. Times have changed. But you know, I you, you say um, 
at Pet Boys, I had a buddy who worked at Checker Auto Parts. And yeah. it was actually my brother-in-law. And I used to call him all the time because I worked at the cool speed shop where all we dealt with was the coolest cars in town, the fastest cars on the strip. And he worked at Checker. And I used to call him and go, hey, um, I'd change my voice and I'd go, hey, I'm looking for a uh, a Dyer 671 blower. Can you get me one of those? And he'd go, oh, we can special order. And he'd get all excited. Like, I got a real guy on the phone. <laughs> I'd get him to quote me the whole thing and everything. And I'd go, and he'd go, how do I order that? And he goes, well, we got to have a deposit. And, he, and, and I'd get right up to the point and then I'd go, Nah, I think I'm going to go over to One Stop Performance and pick it up. There's a guy over there that works. That's pretty good. And he goes, "Oh, Brad, you said you know, he like oh, well. <laughs> wasted so much time with him." Um, all right. Well, speaking of, uh, of auto parts stores, hold on a sec. Let me tell you about O'Reilly. It's O'Reilly Auto Parts Overwards. O'Reilly's the, the the monster player. It's the only one that's probably still around in the auto parts world. But yeah, um, it's O'Reilly Overwards Bonus Points Month at O'Reilly Auto Parts. You can shop in store or online to get points and rewards sent straight to your phone or your inbox. Uh, right now, you can get two, three, or four times bonus points on select per- on select purchases to get you to your next level of rewards even faster. Uh, with 150 O rewards points, you'll earn five dollars reward. Uh, toward pretty much anything you can get over in that store. If you're already an O Rewards member, but you're not receiving your rewards points, just go to your account, add your email or phone number, and you'll get a ten dollar reward just for updating your existing account. I'm doing that today. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm one of those members. <laughs> I go in, give them my phone number every time, and. Uh, you know, get my stuff. Make and- sure you're getting the points because they're doing bonus points this month. Sign up is quick and easy. You can go to O'ReillyAuto.com or go in the store to sign up. Like we said, uh, if you're already a member and you're not getting in those points, sign up and get that $10 bonus. Go in there. Do that. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I'm going to get $10 worth of, you know, that will help me buy some uh, oil or brake pads or something, you know? <laughs> um, all right. So uh, BMX guy, Vision Streetwear. Start getting into cars, and then you land at Boyd's. Well, it was a long road to get there. You know, I mean, <laughs> you didn't just knock on the door like, "Hey, I'm Brad. I'm here." I mean, clear back at ABA when I'm living in Arizona and I've got my nitrous injected El Camino, my you know uh, mid ten second street car that I'm driving to work and um. And and uh, working at ABA, flying around, putting on all the BMX nationals and stuff. I had already bought or ordered through the mail. Back in the day, you used to like send a stel- self addressed stamped envelope. You know, I, I don't know. If <laughs> I you do remember know that. how that worked. Yeah. But, and uh, they'd send you a little catalog and and some stickers. And I had sent off for the Hot Rods by Boy, the very first time he ever offered wheels. And I was like, oh, man, this is the coolest stuff everywhere. I ordered a windbreaker that had Hot Rods by Boyd on it. And I was like, yeah, yeah, this is cool stuff. So years go by. We Vision Streetwear blows up. We become a hundred million plus company in the action sports. And we decide to sell out. And uh, uh, some people in the skateboard industry said we were always sellouts. But uh, we, uh, <laughs> but we, uh, no, we we sell out and divest the company. And I did some consulting, but that wasn't really my thing. And uh, so I uh, went up to Boyd's to actually talk to him about an idea that I had. And I just like called him on the phone and I said, I said, hey man, I want to talk to you about this idea. And I wanted to promote a what I called the tour of performance. And uh, back when shopping malls were still, you know, uh, in the late 80s, still the happening place, there would be these tours that would go there and it'd be something that the managers of the malls would want them to come in. And I wanted to do one that told the history of the muscle car and of drag racing. And I called it the tour of performance. I had talked to uh, Chevrolet about coming on as a sponsor. I mean, dude, I had a, a full scale model built. Um, I had the whole booklet, everything. I went up to Boyd's and I started talking to him and he goes, okay, yeah, yeah, that's cool and everything. I like that. But so you were in the clothing industry at Vision. I go, yeah. He goes, man, I want to do a, 
a clothing line. And I said, a clothing line? I said, you're a hot rod builder. And he goes, yeah. well, you know, we've been doing T-shirts. And I talked him out of that and got him shifted back over to this. But in the course of it, Matt, we became friends. We started having lunch and stuff. And uh, not not too long after that, um, I bought into the company and we became partners. And uh, Hot Rods by Boyd and Boyd Wheels were still pretty small. Cadzilla was in its final stages of completion the day that I wrote him a check. And um, the uh, the rest is history. We grew the company uh, from about a half million dollars a year. Uh, five years later, I took it public and uh, we were doing close to 50 million a year. And uh, then uh, and then everything blew up. And then, so uh, and then the world I, changed. The world changed. Uh, how did you know what happened was no matter how much I told Boyd, a public company was a, a whole different animal. He really didn't understand. And it 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 divided a line between us because I was the business guy. And even though I was out in the shop contributing to the hot rod builds, contributing to everything, and uh hiring the guys like Chip Foose and Jesse James and all the other craftsmen that worked for us, I was the face of the public offering. And so I uh decided to sell out my shares. Um, we kind of split the deal I sold. And uh, and unfortunately, um, the company was uh, bankrupt uh, about two years. Well, not quite two years later. So, Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, it, it is unfortunate, but it, it's business. Oh, There's not much you can do. Yeah. Not much you can do about it. And then, and then Boyd went on to do still Boyd stuff. He he still had his hot rod stuff. The TV show came back. He was still doing wheels. But back in the day, I mean, this was unheard of. I mean, there there wasn't big conglomerates. There wasn't roll up of companies and private equity buying in and and taking Holly and and, and right. You know, owning forty, fifty, sixty brands by then, and you know, and and all of these behind the scenes things that we've seen. Uh, you know, for we in the aftermarket space the very first company to go public in the aftermarket. And let me tell you, that's pushing a boulder uphill, man, because you have to educate the corporate bankers, the the private equity guys, um, because people forget a lot of the big money private equity guys are in New York City. Yeah. What don't they have there? Yeah, they're Call. not driving. <laughs> they're you not know? driving. You know, I and I remember it and – I don't remember the exact order, but I think you guys were first, and then not too far after that, Edelbrock went public. Edelbrock was right behind us, and yes. then and it lasted for a few years, and and it didn't catch on to Wall Street like you're saying, you know, um, and 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 even then, it wasn't a lot of like day trading and stuff because it wasn't really like the internet was at its infancy stages, and I was just a young web developer at the time, um, but it wasn't like we were trading stocks online quite yet, so. Uh, I mean, we were just looking at stock quotes and stuff then, but there wasn't a lot of trading. We saw Edelbrock go public. Um, it did well for a while, and then uh, it was taken off the market and brought back to a private company. Uh, and not a lot has happened between back then and until the past few years where we've had some big roll-ups in the space and they have gone public like uh, like Holly has. Um, and I think Haggerty, for example, is is right. now as well, and a little bit different market, but it's been kind of interesting to see. It's taken I don't know thirty years from when you guys went public to now, you know, quote unquote, Wall Street starting to pay attention, private equity even starting to pay attention to uh, to this world. To this automotive yeah, aftermarket 1995, world, nineteen ninety five, September of ninety five, I took Boyd's public. So from now till, like you said, um, a lot of it though is the television. You know, it opens the eyes. It it shows the size of the good guys shows. You know, you see the the bodies, the the money. You see, uh, you know, private equity people. They look at it from how many people are involved, how many kind of dollars are changing. And 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 look at SEMA, how much it has grown, and they have become even more proficient in uh, gathering the data on the market and like that, which 
was very hard for me to gather accurate data when I took Boyd's public on the overall market because it was just kind of, they were just starting to get started on that um, phase of getting research and like that. And that, that helps all of that. And, and I say, I mean, not to break my arm, pat myself on the back, but a lot of what we did at Boyd's broke ground because one of the things um, even in the television was for those that used to go to SEMA back in the 90s, um, I started producing a video. It was a f- three to five minute video. But remember back then we had to shoot it on beta. We had to edit yeah. it and we had to, you know, um, but we would do one of those mobile vision walls where it was, you know, you didn't have big screens back then. We'd do a mobile vision wall in our booth. And it was a big deal that we would debut our new Boyd's Wild Wheels video. And it was basically what happened at Boyd's the year before the shows. And it was a lifestyle video. We would show cars being built. We'd show our cars being debuted. We'd show the motorcycles, you know, the same thing. But we would show some of the behind the scenes and the lifestyle and theme it every year. And uh, and that kind of lit the fuse for other people to go, wow, wait a minute. And really, it was just what had been done in the after um, or excuse me, the action sports market uh, and how we grew vision um, where we would produce television shows and trade them to ESPN. I just kind of repackaged that and brought it into the aftermarket. And it and it just helped everybody go to that next level. And uh it was it was a lot of fun. I mean, it was it was it was it was uh, it was a blast. If you recall, what was your first SEMA show? My personal first SEMA show. <laughs> My first personal SEMA show that you was, attended <laughs> was 1984. I went um, when I still uh, was at ABA. Yeah. I used to go up. I used to take that week off. And or we'll take a couple of days off, jump on a plane, fly up, watch show a couple of days and come back. And um, and I uh, I wanted to start a shop in Scottsdale. I had the logo. I had the, um, you know, the everything, the business plan and just um, nothing ever worked out, you know. But uh, so I went up. I, I loved it. It was such a, a cool thing uh, to go to, you know. How, how do you think it's – what did it look like then compared to today? Man – Was I, everything you, in black and white? <laughs> you, everything was in black. Well, no, actually, no. It was actually in Kodachrome. Yeah. Uh, but it had that kind of muted uh, – no. Yeah. Um, it was uh, – Presented it, in Technicolor. <laughs> it was still the SEMA show. However, here's one thing that we did at Boyd's that changed the face of the SEMA show. I got a hold of SEMA and said, hey, we've got this big red semi truck. Could we park it out front? And people don't know this, but where all of the drifting and all of that display area out front is, used to be the parking lot. Mm -hmm. And so we said, they said, what? And I said, I want to park our semi and put a row of like, you know, maybe five hot rods right where everybody comes walking in the door. And they said, I guess so, you know, and they gave it to us for free, Matt. That's how different the SEMA show was. Yeah, it was different back then. It was was like, wow, that'd be cool. That'd be neat for people to see as they walked in. Well, the next year there was like, wait a minute, Chevrolet wants to put a truck there and California Street Rods wants to put a semi there. And uh, the next year they came to me and said, we're going to have to charge you 300 bucks. And, uh, and so, but we did that for years and that started and then it just grew pre- before, you know, eventually that parking lot wasn't a parking lot. It was a display area, but we started that. And, um, the other way the show changed was it was just the one primary building. Yeah. So main hall, there wasn't a North hall. There was what they called the rotunda, which was like a round arena. And that's where registration was. You walked out of registration and into the main hall, and that was the entire show. 
yeah, interesting how it's grown. Also, back then, all of the founders of the companies were working the booths. Oh, heck yeah. <laughs> like yes. it, it was still so – kind of still homegrown. I mean now I, all of these brands have been. But as we mentioned, like Holly, which is rolled up and is public, that's – company does over $700 million a year in revenue now. Like it's just a huge uh, monster of a company. Um uh, speaking of good companies, let me tell you guys about Snap-on. Let me just hit this real quick. Today's episode is brought to you by the makers and fixers of Snap-on. Makers and fixers keep the world moving. You find them in factories, repair shops, and roads and rails, buildings, and maintaining everything. Makers and fixers are the backbone of the world. Manufacturing, customizing, restoring, performance, and maintenance – Oh man, I know some makers and fixers myself. I'm talking to one right now. Brad Fancho's a maker. I'm going to tell you a fixer. story about my my Snap On uh, screwdriver because yeah. it's got the lime green handle. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to admit, when I first got it, I thought lime green. I don't know, but you know, I built that steel mezzanine over COVID, right? Yeah, you know all about this. Yeah, I have. I mean, we're talking girder beams and everything. I took on a project uh, and I built this entire uh, steel structure. And then I put a uh, a floor on it uh, of half inch thick plywood, then built nice tubular rails with speed rail. And then I constructed my own uh, steel staircase. Where that screwdriver came into play was I was laying down the floor. And I had put that snap-on screwdriver on one of the eye beams. And I had set it there while I was using it. If that thing hadn't have been lime green, that would still be permanently encased there. It would be, in <laughs> yeah. an, it'd be entombed in my uh, floor. Because I looked down, I saw it, and I went, oh, man, that's my snap-on screwdriver. And I pulled it out and... And uh, But, yeah, man, good stuff. It wasn't the load-bearing screwdriver that held up the entire mezzanine? <laughs> Yeah, I, no, I hope not. I hope not. Um, yeah, that's great. All right. So makers and fixers, it's not just a job. It's a calling. They want to hear from you as well. You can share your story at makersandfixers.com slash carcast and check out makers and fixers on Instagram. Again, that's makersandfixers.com slash carcast. Uh, yeah, the mezzanine turned out great, by the way. Thank you. I, 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 I'm surprised at how good it is. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I gotta say, when you take on a project, you know, building cars and, you know, stuff around yeah. the house, but I mean, a entire structure that has to support. And I mean, I got that thing loaded, brother. Yeah. And I mean, it's, uh, it, it's cool. It's cool. So you haven't seen the stairs yet in person. <laughs> um, wait, have I? Maybe I have seen the stairs. Maybe, yeah, I don't recall now. Oh, maybe I saw temporary stairs. You you might have seen like the first couple because I did it in phases. Yeah, and uh, yeah, because the steel that I used, I did not have a sheet metal break big enough, and neither did my friends. So I had to uh, really do some, uh, you know, calling out. I finally uh, did. I tell you where I finally ended up? Uh, Jerry Seinfeld shop offered to let me use their break the one over by the um um van nuys airport oh yeah and, okay uh, yeah and uh so uh finally got a, a sheet metal break that i could do that eighth inch steel um because let me tell you you don't want to cheap out on the uh on the stairs okay you don't yeah. you don't want to be coming down those stairs someday and have one of them uh you know go collapse on your I, I didn't know you were doing that because I think we have a big uh Bailey electric uh magnet metal break. Of course. Of course. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that. I don't I don't remember seeing that text message saying you needed but, a metal break. Well, Although I, I mean I went over to Jimmy Shines, you know, he's all got all his Bailey equipment and I did three stairs there and I went Jimmy, I don't want to break your sheet metal break. I mean, because it was, uh, you know, because uh, yeah, ours might not be that to big. Over bend them, you know. You under bend a stair so that I learned a lot about stairs that I never knew. But you, you know, because you want a place for your foot to go, you don't yeah. want it straight up and down, and that's what gets it. It's the first part is okay, but then when you got to over bend it, that's a little harder. 
Right. Yeah. Actually, we probably have the same one that Jimmy has. Uh, Jimmy Shine has. So we probably couldn't get it done. Or you could have done the first few. I'll remember that the next time I build steel stairs. You could have done the first few stairs on Jimmy's machine, then broke his machine, then came and finished it on our machine and broke our machine. (laughs) That would have been perfect. Um, uh, All right. So uh, shifting gears a little bit, uh, I just wanted to um, just kind of mention this. I haven't had much seat time in it, but uh, Ford just dropped off the Raptor R. Now, the Raptor oh, this is a V8 truck? Yes. So yes. Uh, I mean the short the short answer you know to the question you're not even asking is is, is it how possible? is how is it? And the answer is it's every bit as a Ford Raptor, but with the engine it should have always had. It has the supercharged V8 from the GT five hundred. They have it configured uh a little differently, it puts out about seven hundred horsepower, I believe. Little odd they didn't like try to Trump the 707 in the in the Ram TRX. They could have done 710 horsepower, but it had to. I, it always comes down to listen. I'd love to say it has to come down with tuning it and packaging and exhaust and whatever, but I'm sure it all comes down to emissions. <laughs> they already had all the EPA stuff done when the TRX came out, and they said we're not going to spend all the money to redo it. It it seemed like uh, it that would probably be the case, but yeah. Uh, it's it's super fun. I mean, the Raptor was already really fun, but now you're you you add that much horsepower to it. Um, the exhaust note is fantastic, uh, it, and you can configure the different settings like you could in in the other truck. You can adjust the steering, you can adjust the exhaust, you can adjust the suspension. Um, interesting, it doesn't have a launch mode uh, like the TRX does. Um, I, I don't know why it seems like it's, it's just a really software needed? thing. Yeah, it just seems like it's a it's a software thing. Uh I don't know. And I know some of the other uh some of the books and publications have tried drag racing it to see how fast it is and what's the best way to launch and 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 stuff. Um and uh yeah, and you know, look, it it hits hard. It's it's great. It uh the sound is fantastic. I want to say the zero to sixty is sub four seconds, three seven, something like that. It's not wildly faster than the TRX, but it's a lot lighter weight. So it's interesting how these these sort of work its way out. I want to say this truck because of the aluminum body and stuff. So it's about a hundred pounds, I think, more than the regular. Uh, Raptor. Once you add the supercharger and the V8 and the intercoolers and all the stuff, um, although the turbo car probably the turbo truck has the similar intercoolers, it adds about 100 pounds to it, and I think it's maybe like 700 pounds less than a TRX, but they're very close to performance. They're within like a tenth of a second of each other, and they both sound fantastic. Uh, I would say. In some aspects, I I like the the TRX. Um, there are some interior things that are happening there that I like. Uh, I, I would the most interesting thing to me is not the Raptor R versus TRX. It's driving the Raptor R versus driving my Ford Lightning for the past however many months. Um, they're both quick. I think the Raptor. Edges out my lightning a little bit by by a couple of tenths uh, on that zero to sixty. I I can't say for sure beyond that. Like what's their quarter mile times? That one I have to look up. the The Raptor is as compliant as the suspension and stuff is having the big knobby thirty sevens on there and stuff. I probably. Not as smooth as my lightning. Uh, and I would say that interestingly enough, I think the lightning is nicer on the inside, but I only say that because I've got the platinum edition, which is the the highest trim level, I guess. And I've got the big touch screen in it. Now, the smaller screen, uh, that's in the Raptor, which is still pretty good size. Nothing wrong with it. I've been using it. It works well. 
But once you get so used to having the big screen with the split screen and the, the you know, uh, you, it's you, you kind of want it a little bit more. And then somebody came over the other day. We went for a ride in it, and they were like, "Well, what do you think of the big screen?" I was like, "I wasn't sure about it, but it it's not stuck up high like up on top of the dash. Both the screens are pretty integrated into the dash." And what I noticed was, um. All of like your radio presets, like the icons for them on the touchscreen, they're they're like two inches in diameter. So now it's easy actually to hit the buttons because the screen is big and the buttons are huge instead of being this tiny, tiny thing. Now, um, yeah, there's nothing worse than trying to, you know, tune in a radio while you're driving and, you know, you're trying to find you got to change screens and do all that and. So if it's bigger, it's going to be a lot better. That's the, that was the big thing is the big screen is bigger buttons. And I thought a little bit about it and I'm going, oh, you know what? I guess if if you're on a job site or something and you're wearing gloves and you want to be able to hop in real quick, move the truck around, change the setting to be able to do that with gloves. Now, I haven't t- tried the touchscreen with gloves, so I don't know if you need a certain type of glove. But this was the same question that came up. Uh, when I talk to Ford and go, hey, you still got the big buttons on the door to unlock the door. But on the on the Lincoln, Adam's Lincoln, it's like it's like hidden behind the plastic panel. It's like a haptic button and it kind of lights up and then it blacks out and you don't see it. And I go, why on the trucks do you still have the actual big like rubber buttons? And they said, because people wear gloves. And I go, oh, people drive this big, burly guys. Yeah, people with people with gloves. So I was like, oh, that's totally smart. I totally get it. Uh, Anyway, Raptor is super fun. Uh, What's the sticker on that thing with the platinum level? um, So it only I I don't know that you can't get it with the with the platinum. But I think um, the one they sent me was 107 um, and then maybe had a few options on it i uh i'd have to we we always got to temper it because whenever we get press cars to drive they're usually loaded to every option which is great that's so we can try everything but it also makes the stickers always to the top level it does you're you're right about that so um and right so the base price of this Raptor R is 75,775. Uh, it's got the Recaro black leather package. Um, it's got, uh, uh, the moonroof and the, the tailgate, uh, uh, package. Um, and the, it's an 802 a, for those of you guys know, it's the 802 a package. So it basically has a lot of the options on it with the spray and bed liner and everything. So, um, 112,000, 111, 900 and change. So, 112,000. A friend of mine sent me a message from Canada and he's like, Oh, over here, uh, the dealers are asking 40,000 over sticker. So Ugh. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Well, Ford was putting an end to that. Uh, you know, they made a big thing about, Oh, yeah. we're not going to allow that anymore. Yeah. But in Canada, they can do it. So uh, I guess so. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I guess this is. Uh, more than a TRX. I, I can't say I've got a hard line decision on TRX versus Raptor R. I think if you're loyal to a particular brand, then you're going to, you know, what decision you're going to make. Uh, both of them are, are super fun. Both of them make the right noises. I, I've driven the TRX and then I've driven the Hennessy 1000 the mammoth or whatever it is, the TRX version. Uh, and that thing is that thing is cool as well. Now they dressed it up with some other stuff and they got the big metal bumpers. They added a bunch of weight and stuff to it. But I will say with that, the tuning is interesting because you don't really get the full effect of the horsepower because the horsepower bump is calibrated into the sport calibration. So in normal calibration, it still feels kind of like a stock TRX with exhaust on it. And then when you put it in sport mode, it really, really wakes it up. So if anybody gets an opportunity to test drive the Hennessy uh, TRX, you want to go sport mode and then just to do yourself a little favor, 
turn on sport mode and then turn the traction control back on because I think it turns it off. So you want sport mode on, traction control on, and then you will have the most fun in that vehicle. And I'll try that this afternoon in mine. You should do that. First, you need yeah. to get a Ram TRX, a Hennessy version. Um, yeah, I- but the Raptor's badass. They sent a dark gray one. It's got um, it's got a lot of the stickers and stuff on it. I don't know that I need it with the stickers. I could probably go down with the sticker delete. I'd be, I'd be fine. It's got little little eights. That's an extra it. twenty thousand. <laughs> it's not the uh, the the Lamborghini SVJ. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, which we've talked about. Yeah, we talked um, about that it, uh, for the SVJ. Uh, it's, you know it's cool, dude. It, it, it sounds it's awesome. A great looking truck. I I, I mean I I like the Raptor. I would like to own one actually. They're they're cool. Um and uh you know the R cuz cuz I it's just that exhaust note with the 6. It just it just didn't seem right on that big truck, but uh you know, is what it is. The um you know, people are going to tune them. They're going to make them faster, louder, bigger, better, all of that good stuff. But uh you know, what we've brought up before on on other shows here at Carcast and Shift and Steer is I, I love that the car companies are 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 making this available. They know what is a good halo car for their brand and they know what customers are very interested in and it's not going to be something they're going to sell 100,000 units of. They just couldn't get away with it with the EPA, but uh, it, it definitely is the fun factor and it gets them a lot of press and it's cool as shit to be able to do this and be able to get that same with all of the Hellcats and GT 500s that are out there. And you know, how many, you know, hybrids and electric vehicles do they need to sell to, you know, to actually make money, uh, you know, uh, to offset these things. But it, it's, it's cool to be able to have these things while we yeah. can still have them. Somewhat on this subject, I want to ask you this. Um, a friend of mine and a wheel customer called me a couple of weeks ago, wanted to order a set of wheels for his new Yukon XL. And uh, it's a Callaway tuned. Yeah. I didn't even know that Callaway was doing those. He's, he's uh, near you though, right? <laughs> Down in yes, Orange County. Yeah. But, but this guy's back in Nebraska and uh, he goes, yeah, I just picked it up. They just delivered it. And, and I want to get some wheels on it. And I was like, I didn't even know about it. You know, I know his Corvettes and like that, but I didn't know he was doing SUVs yeah. and stuff like that. So that was Actually, I haven't seen one. That's kind of interesting. If you yeah. do the wheels for it, it's probably, is it lowered a bit? Not slammed, little but bit. it's probably yeah, going to be lowered slightly. a little bit, right? So we're doing 22s with so that he can have a nice tall tire on it and, you know, because uh, he, he's going to tow his car trailer with it and stuff and, like and, that. Forgive me because I don't know this. Is is that a six lug? Yes, six lug. Because I, di- I didn't know like what size truck they categorize that in. So that would be a six lug. Yeah, right. It's a six lug. So it's like a half ton truck. Right. And and yeah. So when we brought up Bonsby before, you know, the hot rods, the muscle cars, uh, the trucks, not the big off roader trucks, but uh, you guys do have a number of wheels. Not all of them, but some that are six lug or five lug. Every wheel we make is available in five or six, with the exception of about three styles. And we even offer three styles in eight lug, which are mainly intended for the um, the guys who lower their eight lug trucks. Like you know, a dually, yeah. yeah. Look, you know? Are we still doing that? Guys are still doing it, yeah. Still slamming, mean, slamming the duallys? It dual, well, not so much the dualies. I mean, guys are still slamming dualies. Yes, there's a whole market for that. Um, but a lot of the eight lug uh, pickup trucks are like that. And I'll tell you why. Because they're less expensive on the used market. Yeah. And guys that are trying to build something cool on a little bit of a budget, they can save a few bucks on that. Yeah. All right. Uh, Brad, I appreciate it. We're going to wrap things up. I know we're going to hand the studio hey, over. Fun. So uh, uh, thanks for joining us and uh, and catching up. Um, uh, where can we find you? And uh, what are the websites? What are the, uh, what are the social media plugs? Uh, bondspeedwheels.com. Go there. Check us out. Ask for a catalog and we'll get you one. And uh, also you can find me mostly on Instagram at Bradley underscore Fanshaw. And from there you can find I've got – some other things that I do, like my Winbrad stuff. And you can just, you know, find it on there. I always have information right on there. 
Uh, awesome. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks so much. We're going to go ahead and wrap things up. And then, of course, Shift and Steer. That's our other podcast. So if you like the conversation oh, yeah. between me that? and Brad, you can get that uh, every week as well. Uh, Shiftandsteer.com is, is that website. All right, guys. Thanks so much. Until next time, keep the air in the spare and bag of the week. For the latest updates and call-in times, follow the show on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at CarCast Show. If you'd like to write in, fill out the form on CarCastShow.com. And don't forget to give us a nice rating on iTunes. CarCast is a Corolla Digital production and is produced by Chris Loxamana. For more information, visit CarCastShow.com. All month long on Pluto TV, stream the biggest Tyler Perry movies free. Watch your favorites like Medea's Witness Protection and Medea's Big Happy Family. Join Tyler Perry as he goes on a couples retreat with Sharon Leal in Why Did I Get Married? Or Idris Elba and Gabrielle Union in the Tyler Perry directed film Daddy's Little Girls. Plus, Pluto TV has hundreds of channels with thousands more movies and TV shows available on live and on demand. Download the free Pluto TV app on all your favorite devices and start streaming now. Pluto TV. Drop in, watch free.